We engage in authentic conversations about our weekly entrepreneurial goals while exploring business, failures, success, and personal growth. We're going to continue to work and get better at this, so thanks for tuning in. Let's go. Let's do it. Our vision will highlight a diversity of guests who are creatives, industry leaders, and individuals creating positive change within our communities. Join us on the Our Vision podcast. Our shared journey to become better humans. It's not only our vision, but it's your vision too. FSU. FSU. We have Justin Gray with us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm oh, excited to have a conversation with you. Always enjoy sitting with you. Likewise. So what are you up to these days? Oh, it's a lot. Uh, feels like a lot, honestly. I've prob- probably been up to more at other points in my life, but within the last two years, I've worked on honing my focus, clearing my plate, and making sure that I don't have anything on my plate that I don't want there. I'm getting really intentional about that. Consequently, I tend to focus a lot more on those things. And because I have fewer other periphery things pulling at my attention, it feels like I'm a lot more engaged. So yeah, a lot and less (laughs) is the the metaphorical answer. Um, The big stuff right now, I'm preparing to start acquiring resources to build the Airbnb project on my property, my parents' house. Um, That's been a year and a half in the working and we're just starting to get to the point where we're putting putting actual resources on the property, which is exciting. I bet, yeah. Um, Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it's the first step in a larger, much larger scheme. Uh, we're going to, me and a partner uh, in business are going to put up a couple small sheds and start to build a community space in this back remote field on my parents' property. And the idea is to bring bring a sense of intentionality to the space and give people a space to just be uh, without much expectation of how to perform on how to engage. Uh, and we're calling it the Airbnb property because the initial idea was to host it as an Airbnb, but we've shifted that vision now towards a, just a more open community approach. And, uh, the eventual goal is to, con- is to have several buildings on the property and be hosting community events throughout the year. Um, summer camps, uh, workshop programs, retreats, and just having space for people to come escape, retreat, and to be. Yeah, that sounds nice being out in, the, you know, out in nature and having a property to be able to do that. So, yeah, sounds like a worthy project to work on. And also, um, we've talked off air here a little bit about understanding the limitations that you may recognize once you start on a project. And we don't have to dive too deep into it right now, but there are some limitations. So you have a vision, then you start to put that to work, and then you start to realize, oh, this is a hurdle I have to get over. And uh, that happened in this project, which shifted the – shifted the project a little bit right very much so so um but which is okay i think it's better to start doing these things and realizing what what problems need to be solved so you can move forward right yeah um that doesn't stop us from creating something but it does the creation is different at the end so yeah very much well some famous wise man once said that no plan survives execution so the planning isn't so that you know every step along the way It is to prepare you for how to react to when things go sideways, because whether it's planning out a conversation with somebody or planning a multi-million dollar project or even just how you're going to get into work in the morning, you cannot anticipate what's going to happen. Right. You make guesses, you make contingencies, you prepare yourself and then you go do it. Yeah. There's no way to know everything. Yeah. A goal is something to come from, not something to move towards. You plant your flag where you're at so you know where you're headed and then it just becomes breadcrumbs. You keep planting flags. Yeah, so that's been interesting also to have those conversations with you about the shift 
And I like that because it's still, you're still accomplishing something, right? Very much. <laughs> it, doesn't, so. it doesn't leave you just, yeah. oh, I can't do it. This is, this wasn't the way it was going to be. And I don't want to do it anymore. You know, yeah. oh, the hell with it all. You know, and I think that's kind of a bad approach to take. I, I can see people doing that. And I think I've done that in my life too, where you're just like, oh, yeah. that's not the way I want it. So it's just, well, oh, it's all for I, I think society's become very accomplishment oriented. We want to celebrate everything we achieve. So I want a ribbon for figuring out how to, how to build a building. I want, I want to be recognized for talking to this person about this thing. And those have become the badges that we seek rather than the experience we get from them and can extrapolate from them along the way. And I've become a big fan of accruing experience rather than accomplishments. Yeah, there's so much to be said about having an experience. Well, and you've had, and that's one of the reasons we're sitting here talking to you is that we've noticed that you've done a lot of, you've traveled, you've, um, you've not lived a nine to five in the last decade. Um, Brad and I, I think, it, I'm, did you meet him at, at Firelands College? Yeah, through the college, yeah. So that's when we BCT. met. BCT, BCT events. I think that's when I first met you. I think so. Was it, uh, did you go to Gettysburg? Was that? No. Oh, I didn't God, go to, that. to Gettysburg. That was fun. Um, yeah. And that's I remember that happening, but I think I was out of town. That was the first VCT thing I got involved with. I think it was at a, a gathering, one of our VCT family yeah. gatherings. That's been over a decade. It's been 12, 12 years since I graduated college, yeah. I think. Something along those lines. So it was great meeting you there and then um, continuing the relationship and friendship and then um, checking in every once in a while when you're back in town and and getting to know what you're doing and what you're up to and also the, the shift in your thinking because it has developed too. Mm -hmm. You know, what that looked like at... 12 years ago is not the same today as far as what you're doing. Thankfully. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I have this idea that there's a version of me in tomorrow that is getting excited about what I'm accomplishing today and appreciating like this younger version of me I go, you're struggling, but you're going to get through it. And those versions of me progress into the future infinitely. And so the best I can do is, it's what I've got right now, and uh, I'll be appreciative of what I'm doing right now. You brought up something about being more focused and clearing your plate, and somebody had brought you up a mutual friend of ours and asked how you were doing. <laughs> and um, I, that was one thing I could say about you is that I noticed that you become more focused on different areas of your life, and I think that's really healthy at this mm. part of your life. Um, how do you think that's going to move you forward in this next year? Like as far as you said, you're getting more resources and that's going to go more towards the property space. Is there anything else that you're really working? I know you're fixing up the bus too. There's a, yeah. Um, I've got a few different projects. So the, the shift in scope happened about four or five years ago. Uh, when I finished seeing the country, I set a goal coming out of college that I wanted to visit all 50 states and visit like I could only mark a state off as visited once I found someone or something that I wanted to go back to. Uh, so as a result, I've accumulated at least three days in every state, all 50, um, and have now visited every state twice. When I finished all of that, I kind of went through a, a crisis of purpose. I didn't know how, how to move forward. I still craved experiences. But I, I was unsure of how to take all of that experience and use it. Uh, I wasn't good for a nine to five experience. I struggled with routine and I had uncountable interests and curiosities. Can I ask you a question yeah. about like when you traveled, um, of the 50 states that you've been, what are some of your favorites? And I know that seems like kind of a generic question, but like, it's the logical question. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, climate, could it be climate? Could it be yeah. the city? Could it be, it could probably be a multitude of things, but yeah, go ahead. The, the answer I always give is, and it's kind of like your favorite song. Sometimes you're in the mood for Queen. Sometimes you're in the mood for Beethoven. Right. Uh, the consistent place I crave for a specific feel is New England in the fall. 
simply because the feel of the air, the essence of the people in the area, um, the types of food that are present. Uh, yeah, because every place has its own like personality. Very much so. travel, and and then additionally, the people you know in that area frame how you get to know the area. So I know very different groups of people in Colorado that will introduce you to whole different size sides of the geography and the, the political and social landscapes. Um, so, yeah, if I had to pick a favorite, it would be probably the coast of Maine running up towards the interior, uh, cool. specifically in the fall. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my favorite area. But to get back to the, the shift in scope that happened, it was after I visited all 50 states that I started to figure out what is it that really brings me passion in life? Why do I enjoy getting these new experiences? What am I really seeking? Um, just like I took the question of why as deep as I could get. And the thing that consistently came out as I reviewed my experiences and the places I went were I really loved engaging with people. Community was a big focus of mine, particularly around enabling people beyond the scope of their current understanding. Um, if I can help you get further along in the pursuit of your destiny without inhibiting you in, in any way, then that's what I wanted to do. So it's fun meeting people. Oh, it, it is the, the most fun. I seen somebody writing online the other night. There's a space, a library that's using it to, and I might not have it all right, but it's to allow a space to get to know people mm -hmm. in their story. And I'm like, well, I've been doing that my whole life. Like anytime I get a chance to meet somebody, I want to hear like where you came from, you know, not, not in a way of like meddling. I want to understand like how you ended up at my doorstep or how you ended up working for XYZ or kind of that path. And I think there's a lot to be said about stopping and listening to people because you don't know where people come from. And that story is everything. That's true. You, you don't know the people around you. You could spend every day with the same person going through similar experiences and there's still a vast percentage of them you don't know. And to me, like that gap of understanding, that space of miscommunication is where opportunity lies. If we understood and can communicate perfectly, missing out on the inspiration that comes from misunderstanding and the opportunity for growth that we get by pursuing those misunderstandings, like you're missing out on the, the flavor of life right there. So yeah, I, uh, as I had analyzed that I really had a passion for people, I started to shift my focus towards how can I further my ambitions to bring people together to affect the world in a more positive way. What'd you enjoy the most traveling to all the states? How hard it was. <laughs> I didn't do it the easy way. Uh, I'm somewhat uh, masochistic in that way where I prefer doing things the hard way. Uh, so one of my stints, I finished summer camp and did a bicycle tour through New England in the fall and it got to be November and I got back to Ohio and I just didn't want to be in one place, but I only had like a couple hundred bucks in my account. So I decided I was going to do the cheapest way to travel that they ever invented. And I started walking and hitchhiking and that took me from Ohio down to Florida, all the way out to LA and then back to Texas over the course of about seven months. And initially it was just an experience to see if it could work. Like, can people still hitchhike without getting arrested? Or killed. <laughs> or killed. Uh, being a, a larger white guy definitely played into how safe it was for me. Um, and those, those merits were something I was never unaware of. But the, the reality is how can hard we, it was. Can we back up a little bit? Yeah. You just said the camp, and I always speak highly of the camp that you had the opportunity to work on through your eyes mm -hmm. from talking to you. And it was, uh, you worked with children. Um, this was kind of a high end camp. I mean, it was not inexpensive yeah. for families to send their children here. But one of the things you worked on, from my understanding and memory, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you did conflict management and understanding how to work through that and 
set spaces up for children to be able to talk about, you know, conflict management, basically, so they could stand strong in their own, their own well-being, right? Yeah. It, so it was a leadership program, and it was focused on teens, twelve to eighteen year olds, which is an unusual age gap. It is to combined together. It wasn't focused on genders or religion or anything like that. And to cut in a little bit, there's a gap there with that age. They, those kids kind of fall to the wayside and don't have a lot of programs sometimes. It's, so Yeah, and the, the thing that appealed to me about this program was that they weren't focused on a sp- specific demographic, uh, that they wanted as broad a spectrum of people from all walks of life as they could get. So 12 to 18-year-olds, you had hyper-rich people coming in from all over the country, from from all over the world. And we also had scholarships and sponsor kids coming in from the, the deep rural poor parts of the country, as well as the inner city. And all these varieties of culture got to mingle as we taught them all communication skills, leadership skills, new hard skills. We taught kids how to drive tractors and use power tools alongside of how do you give constructive feedback and how do you take that feedback, process it, and wake up the next morning empowered. Yeah, so you're looking at you're looking at two separate uh, this mingling of individuals who have different sets of vocabulary, different sets of conflict management coming into it. Um, social and economic exposure to, you know, maybe art and the musics and their life being more managed or having different assets that they're a part of and vacations and somewhere. So bringing those two groups together, I'm sure you were, that was in, you know, you're seeing this from here. They're seeing it from here. Yeah. Right. And you're an adult at this point. Well, I honestly, I think that's been one of my secret powers is I remember how scared and uncertain I was as a kid. And I remember it keenly, but not in a way that I hold on to as an experience now. But it allows me to empathize and relate to the kids from 8 to 18 on a level that I think they had trouble relating to other adults with. There's a lot of adults around them trying to be adults. I was only ever trying to relate to them and let them know that when they're around me, they have a space, safe space to be. So it was... It was a real privilege to be in an environment where even the adults were trying to facilitate that space. The director uh, was fantastic in that she said, we can't script what's going to happen here. We're putting a lot of random stuff into one space. And the best we can do to protect these kids is make a safety net to keep them bounded and keep throwing them back in to work on what they're working on. And they're all going to grow in different ways. And we just have to be there to help them grow. What kind of results and improvements did you notice with the kids towards the end? Uh, There was some profound differences. Uh, One young lady, Danny, is was uh, she stands out because she showed up to camp not wanting to be there. Her parents had paid to be paid for her to come, and it was there was a whole drama around her arriving and she showed up she jumped out of the car she was upset she was holding her pillow she didn't want to be there and she spent the first week hiding and avoiding and just lashing out in in whatever way she could without getting into a lot of trouble by the end of six weeks she had changed so profoundly in how she communicated, how she comported herself, the type of feedback she gave to people, the way she spoke and interacted with everybody. The kids she didn't like, she understood why she was struggling with them and how to approach still working with them. And then that difference carried over into her home life. She went back home. She started working on her grades more diligently. She started figuring out where she wanted to go for college. The parents' feedback when she came back the following year was just a elation. It was a whole different person. Um, I remained awesome. in contact with her throughout high school just to continue to check in. And she, she went to college. She's done phenomenally in the wake of that. And, you know, there's no way to know what would have happened if she hadn't done it. Maybe she would have found another way to, to grow, but 
to be there to witness the growth is the value. I think you're bringing up an point. That's a great question too. And you Brad. guys can kind of relate to because you you taught. Yeah, so like seeing the change in the kids so, with with. Sometimes we do get to see the change in school. people, and other times we don't. So um, I've been very fortunate. Over, you know what I did up until this last yeah. year for seven years. I spent my life teaching children with autism, and you can see the change that a group of people can have. And not just me. I mean, when you have systems in place and people to bounce ideas off of, because you can't know everything when you're working with children or anybody, a group of individuals, you need other people around you to bounce ideas off of. And you also need to have self-reflection like, eh, I probably could have done that a little better. So you run into all these kind of issues when your heart's in it. You're trying to look to see how you can do the the project better or this workshop better or this or that better. And so, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. I have had the opportunity to see change in children and families and reduction of stress in the home. And, you know, you, you can imagine with Danny, like if her communication was getting better, right. One, let's just take that one segment that would probably lower the stress in that family's home when they could have maybe a op more open conversation with their daughter. Mm -hmm. So when you reduce stress like that and that kind of growth has an effect around you, it's really interesting um, and I think it's important. It's an important thing to continue into. And I think that kind of guide your, that's been a, a huge foundational. It's hugely formative for me. Yeah. Like I, so I'm, when I, when I hear you speak about it, I'm excited that I get to share that even if I don't drop your name and I have, I've shared that story with you and a couple other people in hearing those stories from you, like how important yeah. it is to work with youth on that level. Conflict management, I think. could. Yeah. I think the value of working with youth is we get to see the change much more expediently because uh, they have fewer societally manufactured inhibitions. As we get into adulthood, we figure out how we're supposed to act. And we also have more developed programming around where we're acting. And that's useful, it's safe. It helps us run society in a way that is structurally sound, but it's not always healthy. And so with kids, they're still figuring that out. And you can say one thing and it won't have an effect on them, but three days later, they're going to come to you and they're like, oh my gosh, I get this. And it's going to change their being. And that, that feedback visually, socially is so profound. And, it, and the other part of, I liked about the camp was that it wasn't just the kids that were growing. <laughs> the staff, like... It was impactful and empowering for me. Too. Great point. Because, yeah, teaching kids made me and what you brought up, you do see the change. And it does. And he's he's witnessed it. I've told him hundreds and hundreds of stories of, while I was teaching. And it does it does change you as a person. Like if your heart's in it and you're doing it for the right reasons, I don't know how you don't change, like how you yeah. don't reflect inward, because that's really where the change is coming is you're reflecting inward. Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to present this? to another human being. And that makes you think about yourself and how you're presenting. Right. And am I really living that way? Yep. You can't accountability. Teach yeah. You can't teach something that you're not, well, you can, but yeah. it's accountability is my big focal point these days. And it, uh, just how can I remain of a quality of character now that I feel proud to be accountable to in the future and just guides so much of my life. Uh, and I think it's important now because we see a lot of leaders um, that are in noteworthy positions all throughout the chains of society who aren't actually held accountable. And it's, I think that is a result of years of enabling people to be achievement oriented without actually testing their experience and also for getting people in trouble when they don't have an experience. If you don't know what you need to know, then you shouldn't be where you are has become like the social work ethic attitude. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the reasons you're sitting in that chair today is that I admire, um, you know, what, what is success? So we're looking at that too. We're, and Brad and I are talking about that. What truly is success, right? Is it money? Is it that you have a bunch of friends? Is it that you have, uh, 2 million followers? Is it that you have a high level of education? Is it, you know, so you can define success in a lot of different ways. And one of the things I see about you is that you are successful in the way that you think, right? And the way that you live your life. To me, it isn't always about money. It's about, you know, why are you doing something? 
And and to me, when I look at you, you don't live a nine to five Mm -hmm. and you haven't. That's not to say you won't ever or that you haven't had moments of that. It's that that that's not the driving force. That's that's not my mindset. Right. And and I think you trade off when you work for you at this point in life, doing that would have limited the amount of experiences you would have had, Mm -hmm. which has shaped you to this point to be able to maybe look at some of these other projects you want to do. And um, to me, that's really to me, that's a level of success that I like. That's yeah. one definition of success. And I, th- I see you as living a successful life. Yeah. I, the, so that range of success ultimately comes from one of my weaknesses, which is that I have a low tolerance for misery. And it, that can seem odd when I just said a few moments ago that uh, I'm somewhat of a masochist. I enjoy doing things that are challenging because they further me. But to me, misery is an experience that you subject yourself to unnecessarily. You can be sad. You can go through periods of remorse and melancholy, but it, uh, misery is when you invest in your own sadness. And I, I don't have a capacity to endure that. And I can give an example for myself. Like, so to me, I couldn't go to a job that where I put a screw in every, every Mm -hmm. time for eight. I just, some people enjoy that. I worked at this factory, Lear. I don't even know if it's in business anymore. I was over in Huron, car manufacturing. And they came around and we were like six hours into the shift. And they're like, well, we're offering overtime. And the guy next to me was excited about it. And I went, shit, man, I was done at two hours. Like you're mm-hmm. excited. So I, it's okay for some people. They're okay with doing that. I'm not okay with going in and putting a screw in eight hours or 12 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's misery. Well, it, it, yeah, it comes, like I said, down to defining your why. Yeah. Is, why is that satisfying for them? Why isn't that satisfying for you? And both of those are successful frames of mind for the style of life you're living. For me, I knew that the nine to five career oriented job wasn't going to work. Well, and that's that's the thing, right? We wanted, there's a lot of different paths to success. You know, maybe for that guy that provides the resources he needs and the lifestyle that he's set up and for his family or his kids and he's, he's content or he's happy and he, that's true success to him. So I don't think, and that's the other thing too, is I don't think we should put somebody down because it's not something we're willing to do or that's our misery. Mm-hmm. You know, and there, a lot of times I see people doing that in society. Well, that guy's a fool. He's putting a screw in every day for you're eight hours a day. For your path. Yeah. For my yeah, path, exactly. it's a fool. You know what I mean? But not. Not, Not him. It might be a per that might be something exactly he really enjoys he doing. Yep. My dad taught me that years ago at Ford. You know, this guy was my dad hated hated working at Fords, right? Uh, you know, it's a back bending job, it's repetitive, you know, and I get it. I don't like doing that either. And the guy next guy next to him or in the department loved it. And he really did love it. I don't want to do anything else. Yep. And so I heard that story years ago, and I'm glad I did because that's you know, you have to, and dad didn't look down on the guy. I think that's really important when he told the story. Um, yeah. He told it from the perspective that works for him. It doesn't work for me. Yeah. It's, it's become necessary for my own accountability to look at groups and individuals that I have fundamental disagreements with and try to think of how I could build a bridge of connection and value in the face of working with them. If I had only people I disagreed with and I had to make something work, how would I go about that? And it's to me, it's not about how do I change me or them? It's how do I make a situation where both of us can exist in a copacetic way? Yeah, that's a healthy way of looking at it for sure. And not always an easy task. Where do you get that mindset from? Uh, It comes from a lot of watching. I was the youngest of six kids and I got to watch a lot of my siblings go through different routines. None of them went through, went through traditional paths in, in their growth. And I got to see a lot of that. I also had a very untraditional, non-traditional upbringing. And the most valuable part of all of that was just vast exposure and I think I was six or seven years old. And I remember sitting on the front stoop early one morning and looking out on the world and thinking, I've only experienced this little chunk of the world. 
and still feel overwhelmed with how much information I'm getting, how much more is there out there for me to know before I know. And uh, of course, it was in seven-year-old vocabulary. Good question, man, because he's he's brought this up twice now. I don't know if you've noticed, Brett, as he's talking about his childhood. It, it seems like there was a level of anxiety that you've worked through. Very much so. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm hearing that. And I don't know that I know that part of you. Yeah. It's, well, because you guys met me in college, which was right around the time I started to really engage who I was rather than engage myself in the way the world wanted me to be. And for um, very young, as soon as I started being socially exposed, but even within my family, I was just anxious because it felt like everybody else had an idea of how the world should work. And I'd missed out on that manual. I didn't get that instruction tutorial. Thank God. So I had to figure it out from the ground up. I'm happy you didn't. Me too. <laughs> on some yeah. Well, it, it allows you to look at things with new eyes. And that's become something of an obsession for most of my life is looking at what everyone else is doing and then what are they missing in this process where are the bottlenecks that they've just accepted as part of the process and do those bottlenecks need to be addressed how can we change them and misery was a bottleneck for society for so long i think i use a, a, a different word than misery sometimes i yeah. say to me i say to me like it's like um, if my heart's not in it i'm not doing it yeah and that could be a job you know it just it's a good value of my time. Is it something I'm really into? Yeah. Am I just going to pretend to go every day? And whether that be for a paycheck or working with somebody or, you know, like, I don't, I don't want to do that. Life's yeah. too short. So it's, to me, it's the, I kind of look the opposite it way. It could be the other way. And yeah. circumstantially or to the individual, the word will be different. Right. Right. Um, for me, I just saw a lot of people, the idea of being in one place doing the same thing for 40 years, filled me with dread that I would not tolerate. You don't give yourself enough time to be miserable anyway. So no, <laughs> you're constantly <laughs> moving and yeah. Um, and, but I mean, there are contrasts. I think the wisdom comes from contrasting experiences. When you have two experiences that seem completely disparate and irreconcilable that you somehow have to figure out how a bridge between so I have these periods of time where I was extremely social, always on the move. And I would contrast those with these periods where I was stagnant for several months and very socially isolated, which gave me time to reflect, review. And there were periods of loneliness and sadness in there. But I embraced those as part of the process of living the way I'm living. Simply because I didn't hear about it doesn't mean that it's not healthy. And I was living in a way that nobody else had told me how to live. So... I was forging my own path. Well, there's some balance to that. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, you find that equilibrium. Sometimes you can't go nonstop without slowing down. I mean, that's still part of being a human. You have to slow down at times to go, okay, where am I at? Or I need to recharge or I need to lick my wounds from mm -hmm. that didn't work, you know, because not everything you try works. Hopefully. So there's like this pushback sometimes when you're you, you know, like we talked about it earlier is like you, you you start a project and you're like oh wait a minute i didn't know that the town was going to make me do this or i didn't know oh i couldn't do this or i didn't understand the regulation here i didn't understand the amount of time it's going to take to do that i didn't understand that it was going to cost yeah. fifty thousand more yeah so you know so you have to back off sometimes from that you know just moving forward doesn't always just come without you stopping for a second or a month or three Slowing months. Slowing down is valuable too. Um, like having hiccups uh, in the accountability group that I put together, one of the big things I focus on is, is kind of recognizing when you're struggling with a goal. It usually happens because you don't understand why you're doing it or the motivation behind it has changed. And so you hear a lot of people that say, well, I want to get into shape. Why do you want to get into shape? Well, because, of, you know, you'll be healthier. Well, why do you want to be healthy? You're healthy now. You're breathing. Dig into the why. Know why you want to do something. Because if you don't know why you want to do something, then you're not going to want to push through when it gets hard. So having part of it is knowing yourself why you want to do it. But then the other part of it is being acknowledged for what you're doing. And that's where I think the value of the accountability group has been 
There's a group of people that meet up regularly and that everyone has a chance to debrief into. We're creating space for people to show up, talk about what they want to talk about regarding their goals, their struggles, their success. We offer some reflection. And then at the end of that day, we're all that much more motivated and aware of what it is we really want to be pursuing. Can anyone be a part of this accountability group? Yeah, we're, so we're just starting our second quarter. Um, last quarter was the first time it was kind of the pilot program. Uh, we had five people, looks like we're going to have about 10 for the second quarter. So the, the biggest limiter right now is simply uh, having enough facilitators and making sure that we can maintain the culture of what we're trying to facilitate. Um, it's different from a support group. It's different from a men's group because we're trying to diversify into every range of age, ethnicity, and gender. If there's something you want to achieve that you feel like a group of people being present for you would help you achieve it, then this type of thing is for you. Well, it's important to have support. Very and sometimes you, when you say something, somebody can come back with some feedback mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, I didn't even, I didn't even think of that. Or, you know, could be, like you said, coming from a different gender, age, education, yeah. getting their feedback might be invaluable because you might not even have been exposed to that thought process yeah. to be able to think of it. And plus the accountability of saying, this is what I'm going to do. So there's, there's a raw value in simply speaking what it is you want. And there's a hierarchy of awareness that I've seen represented many different ways where the first base level is the experience itself and then your awareness of the experience within your own mind. And then speaking the awareness, like acknowledging it, processing it, but then speaking the awareness out to the world, cements it into the mind in a way that produces a profound shift in how your brain acknowledges that experience in the recall. But then when that experience is acknowledged by the world, there's an automatic programming of value that cements it as something that your brain will hold on to. The experiences or the physical experience you have around an event gets programmed into your body as a set of tools and responses that it might use later. And if that set of responses you engage in is positive, there's a whole different set of responses your body has than if it is poorly received. So having a group of people willing to receive you saying what you want and affirming it in a positive and supportive way programs your body to want to achieve what you're doing. Well, and depending on the project too, you need to make people aware of what you're doing. I mean, if you're just hoping I'm going to build a table, Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. We actually had so, a guy build a table. Well, and that was one of his goals. Right. So, so you, I don't. I didn't know that, but yeah. Um, you know, you, I say, "Well, I'm going to build a table, right?" Right. And so you, and the guy looks at, you, "Well, what, 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 what are you going to use to do that?" And well, I'm going to. I don't know. I haven't thought. Oh, well, I probably want to use a uh, live edge piece of wood. Do you have access to it? And, well, yeah. I, no, I need to think about that, right? Or do you have the legs to it? Are you going to build the legs? Or are you going to buy the pin legs? I don't know what. And so when you start speaking it out, you're thinking it out. And now you, depending on the type of project too, can be very helpful to start thinking that out because then you're collecting people to be a part of that too. Yeah. Um, and I, so I like the idea of becoming a part of the accountability group and seeing how that works. So. Yeah. I'm glad to have you guys on board for this quarter. The, um, just working through, because it really is about showing up for yourself. That's, that's what the group's for. Ultimately, if you don't show up, there's still a group of people there that are showing up for each other. But when you show up, it's because you value what it is you're pursuing enough to present it so that other people can weigh in on how they can help you or how you can help yourself. So I'm really thrilled with how the first quarter went and then where we're going in the second quarter. Yeah, I'm excited to be a part of it. So thanks for thinking of us and inviting us to the group. Yeah. How do you get involved? Are I don't know if you're willing to put this out there. Is there a way people can contact you if they want to be a part of this? Uh, right now, it's, it's very grassroots and we're just basically doing it word of mouth. I don't expect there to be a large marketing campaign for okay. it at any right, point. Right. We're not, it's not the numbers, it's the quality. And that's really where we're focusing. Um, but I also want it to be accessible as a format to anybody that wants it. So 
the idea is to eventually refine it to a basic set of principles, like a one sheet guideline. And even if you're not meeting with us, you are able to take this sheet and get a group of people together. Yeah, to, that's awesome. To debrief, to work into, to support each other. So right now, it's if you know somebody that's in the group, reach out to them and check in. Uh, it, it's quarterly right now, so every three months we start a new group. But yeah, there's no there's no website. There's not really uh, so there's not a social yeah. media. It's yeah. direct connect. I think it's a great concept. Not only a concept, but I'm glad you guys did it for the first quarter. And it sounds like you had some success out of that meeting with people. It probably made you think of what you were working on a little stronger. So Yeah. And and it is a component that ties into the other projects that I work on as well. So it's it's a lot of spinning plates that will eventually form into something bigger. Yeah, I really like the overlap working with individuals that have like similar thought patterns. It's very helpful. And I think as you start to surround yourself with working on a project or moving forward or doing things in a, in a way that you perceive success, you're going to run into these other people that have kind of a like-minded vision, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's nice to overlap projects and get to know each other and to work and help each other out. And I think that's a real doable thing in our society. I think that's kind of how business works. I think it's how social nets work and all that. You, you start to surround your, and for me, it was like when I had drug addiction, right? I wasn't hanging out with people that weren't doing drugs. Yeah. If I'm drinking too much, I'm not hanging out with somebody that's sober, yeah. right? That, so I know that from being sober, you know, many, 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 many years. Yeah. So you shift. That's one example, right? So if I'm like, I work, I work at a factory, the group of people that I'm usually hanging out with after hours might be part of the people I work with. And when I was a teacher, I hung out with a lot of teachers, right? And yeah. so. Well, they say you're the combination of the five to 10 people you hang out, hang out with the most. And that I find to be true. And you can take it as kind of a passive piece of information. And, okay, who are the five people I spend the most time with? And am I a conglomeration of them? Or you can start to think of it proactively in terms of, okay, who do I want to be like? And who do I know that emulates some of those characteristics? And I've started to get very intentional about that sort of community building around myself within these last few years, um, which has contributed to the shift of mindset, the change in priorities, and the starting of these projects. Yeah, I think, I, and you brought up a good point there, is like, who do you, like, not that we use people, but people that are moving forward that had attributes are different. They've worked on things that you want to understand more about, or you need that as part of your organizational improvement, right? You want to get next to those individuals and, and see what they know, you know, in a way, and see if you can get mentored underneath them, right? That's what I, it seems silly, but like we bring it back to the guitar. If you're the wor worst guitar player, you want to, it's easy to find somebody when you start to climb up, it's probably harder in your area to find somebody that can, you know, teach you music yeah. theory or understand. So same thing with working on projects. There are certain skill sets that you need that you lack. You cannot have, there's no way to have all the skill sets. Yeah. Um, I always run from somebody that knows everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. It can, it can get overwhelming. Uh, focusing on the size of it sometimes and it, it it's helpful then to have somebody draw it back in work on okay this is so huge we've been working on it for six months and we have not made any progress where can we shift our focus macro micro yeah so rather than getting this like myopic perspective of failure or not having success the way we envision it we can always pivot and having somebody help you with that is to my mind, the greatest value of community. I mean, yes, we are we are each pursuing our own goals within the scope of this, but we also count on each other to to give feedback about our processes. Well, and I think anytime you're developing something, it's not in isolation. When, you know, when, not. when you're looking at art, you're looking at other artists. When mm. you're looking at photo photography or videography, you're looking at what other people are producing. When you're looking at business, you're looking at what people are doing out there and that's working. There's yeah. a lot of things that can be reinvented and there's some things you should, 
there's no need to reinvent. Like it doesn't take away from a project to use a system that's already in place. Why it, it works well. That doesn't say you don't try to improve it. So yeah, there's all these moving parts. I don't think when you're working on anything, life doesn't happen in isolation. A lot of times no. we're very, you couldn't be where you are without the infinite efforts of the innumerable people before you. Right. And that's, that is factual. Uh, if you want to retreat into isolation and go build a house in a cabin in the woods, you're still building structures and using knowledge that you adopted before you got there. Right. So, yeah. Short of being born and abandoned in the woods. But even then, if you break down the concept of a relationship, you're going to be learning about relationships from the perspective of a raw natural forest, how animals interact. So, we are part of a system of relationships and to want to build something in isolation is respectable in terms of it as long as it's a test of your skill that you want to hone if it's isolation that you want to do to get away from everyone that's made out of like malice or hatred then i think that you, you start to to miss the value of relationships he brought up a good point is like you, there is time to hone something mm -hmm. and, I, and I, that's what i like about the long format of being able to speak to you is the, like we're, we're talking for an hour here and then you know we can't cover everything but you're right there's time to pull away to hone things but i think that when we talk about our personalities um isolation is fine in times but for the most part we want to connect with community and so part of being a part of community is actually connecting and learning how we fit and how we can facilitate yeah. and liaison and communicate and create and you know create spaces for people to be able to grow and and uh learn right so um that's what i meant more of of you know we don't live in isolation when we're building a project so so what i was going to say is you're working on a bus ah, yes. what's the idea behind that well uh it's an upgrade in some sense of it the it's the bus you and BB did the podcast yeah, in, right? Yeah, I did yeah. a podcast in it with BB. Yeah. Um, so most of my travels have been very, uh, very low dollar endeavors. Uh, riding my bike across the country, hitchhiking, um, or scraping enough dollars together to fly somewhere every so often. When Megabus came out and I could spend 10 bucks to get back and forth from Chicago, Oh, I took advantage of that. So for the most part, I've been living out of my backpack for 10 years. And to me, that was fine. I liked the idea of only having what I had with me and not having to worry about a whole house full of things. Um, but it was problematic in that I could only ever live in borrowed space that whether I was surfing on someone's couch or leasing a space, it was somebody else's. And at some point they could come in and say they needed that space and I had to leave. It never happened. But when something isn't yours, you're always aware of it. Having a bus was my way to solve having a space I could develop myself in consistently while also being mobile. And so the idea is that by giving myself space, I get more intentional about what it is I'm doing and can use that space as kind of a megaphone to project my intentions from. I don't think I've heard him say it that way before. I like that. You're That's, always aware that the space could be taken away from you. And you, yeah. and you being a, a kind person, you're gonna be aware of that. Very and nice. maybe hyper aware of that to make sure that you're not maybe overstaying your time or that you're invading somebody's privacy. I can see you, there's lots of different layers there that you became aware of. That's mm -hmm. interesting too, though, because there's a lot of value in being exposed to that for years. And how do you carry that into your life now when you walk into a room or you're sitting here visiting with us today? I'm sure it has an impact on how you think. I, I think there's a way that I read the spaces I enter that is different and has been impacted because of that to a deep and fundamental level is that I can read a room and understand something of where that person is at 
on maybe a deeper sense than most people can because hmm. I spent like I was in a different house on a different couch for week after week after week after week after week for a year or in someone's car. Like the the spaces we are in are our shells. We use them to facilitate our purposes. So if your space is built to be relaxed and lazy and easy, then it tells a story in conjunction with your personality and how you engage the people around you. Yeah, there's a lot of learning from traveling like that. Good question. And I, don't see you, I don't see you being one to ever settle down. Yeah, I struggle with so that. It's perfect for you. It's, I'm uh, excited that he is though on some <laughs> level because he is. You, he actually like. I feel like a shift's happening. I, I'm I'm learning to pace myself. Uh, there was just a, an insatiable lusting for the horizon and what stood on the other side of it for most of my youth, and part of that was to accumulate enough experience so I could assess with some measure of wisdom what the best way to do something was. Is this a good way to approach it? Is there a better way? And when I say something, I really refer to interacting with people. Is there a healthier way I can interact with people or things even? I, my relationship with this chair, with the glass that's holding the water that I'm drinking, each of those is a relationship that I have a respect for now because I've seen them engaged in so many different contrasting ways. And so having that scope, that buffet of experiences to draw from gives me a sense of how I can walk through the world on my own path while still offering support and respect to the things around me. So with all the, the, the traveling that you've done, what would you say was the most life-changing thing that happened to you? Because I know it's evolved you over time with your travels. Hmm. That's tough. There's, there's so there's many, probably things. more than one, but yeah, there's pivotal experiences in every single one. It doesn't have to be one. Um, I mean, going, I, I could give you anecdotes for hours, but I think most recently the, the, bicycle trip I took across the country is something I can draw back to directly. It was like a physical representation of a shift that was going on within me. It was very much the physical closing of one chapter so I could open a new one. And it happened like when the pandemic happened. I lost my jobs for camp and for working at conventions and all these seasonal gigs and hustles that I'd built up for years evaporated and not really being money focused or having bills to worry about. I wasn't stressed about it. I tried to find a job. It didn't work out. So I thought, okay, I have some new opportunities. I now have a clean slate. What do I want to build from here? Um, so I decided I needed to do something to engage a different mindset. So I started riding across the country and I didn't know if I was going to make it. I hadn't, I didn't condition for it. I hadn't ridden my bike in almost two years. And I was starting with geographically the most challenging part of the country. I had to get over the Olympics and the Rockies. Uh, so I said, if I can get over the mountains, it's all downhill from there. And there's something interesting that happens to the psyche when you vacate a known space and put yourself out where your priorities are simplified. So if you can get somewhere to camp or be away for a week, your mind changes. And if you're in there for two weeks, it starts to really break down these social structures that we don't even realize we build up. Being on the road, in a relatively cloistered country, like this, this was early 2020, um, nation still in the midst of the pandemic, I was isolated pretty dramatically for most of three months. And the shift that I was able to go through intentionally and passively was profound. I came out of that bike ride a dramatically different version of me than I was before. 
I'm just pausing to think of your words there a little bit. Yeah, so that isolation. And when you get in your own brain, that goes back to finding a balance, I think. When you are when you feel, you felt like, uh, okay, clean slate. What can I do with my time? Um, I don't really know how this is going to work out. You said that you don't really, when you put yourself in that position, like you don't yeah. really know what's going to come out of that. But the, Yeah, the first two weeks it was really just, am I going to survive this? Can my body handle it? Uh, it had been six years since my last real significant bike tour. And I'd used my bike a bit in between, but not, not in that sense. So the first two weeks is just, can I survive this? Am I going to hurt myself and at the end of three months have to go through serious medical rehab? And the deal I always make myself is if I start waking up with enough aches and pains that I really don't want to ride, then I don't ride. Right. And listen to your body. Yeah. So once I got through those two weeks and I was still surviving, what happened then was processing. I wasn't taking in a lot of information. My, I wasn't having to engage information. I wasn't consuming stuff on my phone. I cleaned all the apps off my phone. I wasn't watching TV. I wasn't watching movies. There was no social interactions that I had to adapt to. Oh, a so bird, I, a squirrel. Yeah, it was the wind simply blew. like, okay, <laughs> that hill's about a mile away. So what am I going to think about for the next mile? And so all these little, it's like the bookmarks you have on your web browser that now I'll, I'll look at that later. All those unprocessed thoughts and considerations and ideas that we consume unknowingly through our days started to get processed and ratified into a structure of understanding. That quiet time is important. I do that on a different scale. Nothing like you do, but I go to the lake every night mm -hmm. when it's warm. I don't like the cold, so I don't fucking do it. Right. But when it gets warm, I go sit there every night for two, maybe three hours about let's have a gig. And that quieting down moment, those bookmarks that you're talking about, it's like gives you time to process, you know, and then kind of kick off the day or kick off your failures or just take in, just take in the beauty of nature. Um, and I think that's really important is, to me and maybe some other people just think that's com complete crap. You know, my grandfather had seen no desire to go near the water. Why would you go sit near the water? That's just not something he did. But for me, that works. So finding your own balance. Yours was a bike ride. Mine was a sunset. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, finding that space. And you can survive without it. The, the plasticity of our resilience as humans is outstanding. You can endure any stress. Yeah, but I think it's important for us to take time to slow down. We've right. got, we're bombarded. You talked about clearing off your apps. You talked about, you know, we are we are bombarded all the time with input and this and that. And you got to do this and blah, 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 blah. And you need this new mm -hmm. exercise equipment that's going to sit in your, on your exercise room and it gets used maybe for the first six months and then it sits there and you got to hire somebody to come carry it out. Like you can be bombarded. And I think we need to slow down a little bit. I don't care what we're working on. I don't care if we work for somebody else. You have to find times to slow down. No, there, there's value. There's that. so much value that, to it. That ties back to what I mean about contrast. If when you are engaged in your phone and all the news and the rapidity with which information passes through us and around us, you're engaged even if you're not engaging it. And if you don't find that, that space of stillness and silence, meditation is a great practice because it lets you notice what you're noticing and then go to a deeper place. But if you can find that physical space and create the temporal space where you don't have things weighing on you, then the difference is profound. Like it can change who you are. Well, it, it, it's powerful. Yeah, it changes us the way we feel about ourselves, about others. You know what I mean? Like, it's just so many, there's so many benefits of slowing mm -hmm. down and creating a space or a time to do that. Yeah. And I think that's one of the areas that I've done well at, in my life. Where it, there's peaks and valleys of doing that. And like you said, you went on more of a long journey of doing that, right? But I think in everyday life for people, you know, not everybody's going to jump on a bike. And that's okay. That's talking about success, like how we how we drive our own lives. But I think a common thing for people would be very helpful is to have a space to slow down. You know, you think of a mother that's got six kids. You always hear this, or, or even two kids. You hear parents where they're like, you know, it's okay to be a parent and slow down a little bit for yourself, right? 
you know, and I always hear people saying they don't have time. We, there's 168 hours in a day or a week, right? We all have the same amount of time. It's how we choose to d- divide that time up. And Brad and I have been speaking about that lately of, of having that discussion. And we're so glad to come on to this accountability group because we want to take that 168 hours a week and chunk something out that's going to move us forward. Mm-hmm. And either whether that means something personal or business or health, whatever, everybody's going to choose something different probably in that group. And um, I'm excited about exploring how we use our time. Me too. So I, I think that's the biggest thing I want to say back to people is like, how are we using our time? And then we're not just talking about money. We're talking about to create money. Maybe we're talking about creating a healthy, so, a healthy mental space. Money, money is simply a facilitator. <laughs> yeah. So to do anything requires time, resources, and effort. And money can account for, for those things on its own. So money is a facilitator. Right. And I, I remember working for a guy and I'm convinced he, and I'm not going to go into the story completely. I'm convinced he kept me around is how could this, how could he be happy? He doesn't have anything. And he had the Lincoln and an airplane and could fly. And, and I'm convinced he kept me around. I was like, why is, why is Joe happy? (laughs) How could he possibly be happy? You know? And so, you know, I think finding that space, I'm glad you're bringing that up because that's really powerful taking time and moments away to create a space to get away from everything and have your own thought. Hmm. Cause right now we're being told how to think a lot of times when we're consuming that much information on our phones and our apps and television and everything. A lot of that's telling you how to think what to wear, how to act, what music to listen to. You know, this is identify with this brand because these people do work out or these people are hippies or these people are, you know, whatever, right. Think out of the box a little bit. To think out of the box, you have to take time to slow down and to block all that out on some level. So, um, yeah, I really admire that you, the way you do that. I wish I I can. It's a choice, right? It's it's your why. (laughs) Hopefully I can continue to take that process into the future and continue to affect the world in a positive scope the way I want to. We are at the hour mark, guys. Justin. Is there any advice you'd want to give to anyone out there with taking what you've learned throughout your life that could help those out there that are maybe stuck Mm -hmm. where they're at? My biggest ones are find the why of what you're doing where you're at and the why of what you want in the future. If you can figure out why you're doing what you are doing, that gives you a sense of what's important or what was important that got you to where you are because everything you do made sense and was valid in the moment when you made that decision in the future it might seem unwise but when you made that decision it was the best decision you could make in that moment so understanding the why equips you to assess those histories with more wisdom and more compassion and then by looking into the future of what do you want in the future and why do you want it it lets you move more intentionally through the space that you're in right now. We really appreciate your time nice. coming yeah. on and we yeah. value your time sitting here with you and always do visiting with you. If there's anything we can continually do to help you, let us know. Yeah. You guys um, are part of my community. So and that's, thank you. That's the biggest contribution you can continue to make. So thanks for having awesome. me guys. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Good thanks Justin. You.